ions, they have electric charges. So when they flow, it means that voltage is created at the synapse of the second neuron. We have electric voltage now, isn't that interesting? So, okay, we have electric voltage. Now let's actually go back to our previous picture. Okay, all right. So this was the story of just one synapse receiving one spike. Imagine this neuron is connected to many other neurons and it has many other synapses. So every time, you know, there are spikes and action potentials coming in at different time and they create voltage at the synapse of this second neuron. So what happens is that all these voltages then go to the soma of this second neuron and the summation the summation of all these voltages are calculated. If the summation hits the neuron's threshold, then there is an output spike, again, traveling along the axon, and the story repeats. That's what I was trying to say by, I, so I, but when I was saying that, okay, the neuron, when it gets excited, there is an output. So, well, this is the story in our brain. However, this can be very challenging, mathematically complicated to capture the details of what's happening in here. Like if you want to create a formula that explains this, it's not as easy, right? The good news is that artificial neural networks, the good news is that artificial neural networks, they try to create simple artificial neuron model to capture this behavior. So as you see in this picture, there are inputs coming in, x1, x2, xn, like the timings that were coming in in our neuron. The difference in here is that x1, x2, xn for an artificial neuron model, they don't have to be necessary time. I'm going to explain to you with an example what they can be. So then these inputs are adjusted with weights. Remember when I said there is a voltage created at a synapse, of course, sometimes voltages can be bigger, sometimes they can be a smaller. We capture that notion, that concept, we capture that concept with the notion of weight. So if you want to show that behavior, we say that, okay, we have our inputs, and then they are multiplied with weights and they are added up. So we get the summation of, for example, W1, X1 plus W2, X2 and so forth. So that summation then goes to a mathematical transfer function. For example, for example, a sigmoid function. So, Based on this transfer function, which is just a mathematical function, the output of the neuron then is calculated. So for example, for sigmoid, the output is a number from zero to one with zero being the minimum and one being the maximum. So you see this mathematical transfer function, it's trying to create a relationship between that summation weighted inputs and the output of our artificial Near. And there are other there are other transfer functions, mathematical transfer functions used in artificial neural networks. So this is the story of one artificial neuron. So of course, as we mentioned before, our brain has billions of neurons, layers of neurons, right? How do we show it for simple neural networks? Okay, we show layers of neurons with these circles representing a neuron. And like, of course, this is a very simple picture, but let me actually, yeah. So this is an architecture for a neural network. You see different layers and each layer has a few neurons here. The very first layer is the input layer and the last layer is the output layer. Whatever layer we have in between, it's called hidden layer. So the more, hidden layers you have in your network, the deeper your network is. You probably have heard about deep neural network, that depth refers to hidden layers. This is a very simple architecture for neural networks. 
But let's explain how artificial neural networks work actually with an example. One of the main applications of artificial neural networks is image recognition. What does that mean? So suppose that you feed an image of a cat to a network like this. So the, the network is supposed to predict for you that this is a cat and puts out a label cat. This is one of the application of the neural networks to be able to recognize the images and patterns that they receive, for example, a cat. But then the question in here is, when I say, let's feed an image of a cat to the network, I mean, how do we exactly feed that image to the network, right? Is, is the network, is the network like, is going to like touch it or I don't know, see it? No, so remember the network, the neurons in the network, they understand numbers. They work with mathematical functions. So the question is, how is an image translated into inputs of a network? Or in other words, how the network is going to read an image. Any idea? <laughs> the answer is with pixel brightness. So think about it like this. This image has hundreds and thousands of pixels, like the pixels that you have on your TVs, the screen that you're actually watching this with. It has many pixels. So each of these pixels has a brightness that they created a, a scale of 0 to 255 to kind of represent pixel brightness. So when a pixel brightness is 0, it means that it is totally black, totally dark. And when it is 255, it means it is totally bright, totally bright. And 0, it means it is totally black. So now imagine these thousands of pixels that we have in this image each one of them now has a number, right? That pixel brightness. And each pixel brightness, that number, then each of them is actually represented with a neuron in the first layer of this network. So you can imagine, you should be having like thousands of neurons in the very first layer of your network to just be able to represent a simple image your network can be really huge. So now the next step, you see that these neurons, each of these black circles, they are connected to other circles in other layers with these lines. Think about these lines like those synaptic weights, all right? That, for example, those synaptic weights are multiplied with these pixel brightness numbers and then all of them, they go to the neurons of the second layer. So now the neurons of the second layer, they are receiving the summation of these weighted inputs from the first layer. And based on the mathematical transfer function that they have, like sigmoid, they are going to put out a number from zero to one, for example. So the story repeats. Now the outputs of the second layer are connected to the third layer, fourth layer, and so forth. The question in here is, well, why do we have several layers in between? I mean, what is each layer doing here? If you look at the image of this cat, well, by looking at this, hmm, you see some edges, for example. You see some patterns, for example, on the sheet and like, for example, the hair of this kitty. So in a way, the network, each layer is extracting a feature. Like for example, the first layer can extract the edges of the cat, for example, and the edges in this picture. The second layer is kind of extracting the patterns in this picture and so forth. So each of these layers, think about them that they are trying to extract some features, okay? So, so far so good. Any questions so far? Feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. 
Okay, so, but then the question in here is, how does the network learn to recognize if this is an image of a cat? How does it recognize it? So now the answer is that, suppose that we give this network an image of a cat and say, look, this is a cat. So in other words, the network sees the input and knows what is the output, right? And then the network starts adjusting its weights. Think about synaptic weights at these branches like knobs, right? That the network starts, you know, adjusting the knobs, adjusting the weights, so that given this sample cat, the output is exactly cat. Of course, we are going to give a lot of images of a cat, of different cats, to a network and of course the network knows the output so the network trains itself and adjusts the weights that can recognize picture of a cat so once we do that once the network is trained with many images of a cat then if you give an image of a cat without network knowing what the output is we are expecting with a high probability that the network exactly predict that that is a cat, okay? But there is one more question here. So we said that, okay, basically when the networks at the first place, place knows what the inputs are and what the outputs are, it starts adjusting the knobs and its weights. But how does that do that? We said that the network just works with math with numbers. Basically, the network exactly use mathematical algorithms like gradient descent to like using just this simple formula to adjust the weights so that the prediction is with a high probability correct. And this is a simple example of artificial neural networks and how they do pattern recognition, for example, image recognition. Well, as we mentioned, artificial neural networks, they were inspired by the human brain at the first place, but they basically used very different things to make their algorithms optimized. They have been extremely successful in what they did. However, there are other researchers that they said, look, we just want to go back and see how the brain works and we want to exactly model our neurons, model our networks, exactly the way that the human brain works. And that field is called a spiking neural networks. Remember that I said at the beginning, our brain is created out of 100 billions of neurons that each time a neuron is excited, there is an output spike and those spikes travel between the neurons and carry information with their timing. So timing is a very important factor in spiking neural networks. What has been kind of, you know, it, that is one of the main differences between the spiking neural models and artificial neural models. That the spiking neural models, they work with timing. This is a simple example of a spiking neuron model now. As you see, now the inputs are times. T1, T2, T3, Tn. They go to this box. They go to this neuron, for example. And they are adjusted with delays. And they create synaptic voltages. We call it synaptic activity. And the synaptic voltages are adjusted with waste. This is the same as artificial neurons. And then the summation is calculated. When the summation of the total voltage hits the threshold, then there is an output spike at time tau. So remember, what we are doing in here is we have input times and we have an output time, right? And in a spiking neuron models, like what I was trying to do in my research, for example, in, in PhD, find a transfer function, mathematical transfer function, a relationship between input times and the output time. So I cannot emphasize enough on time. Having a closer picture of this summation, so we actually showed it with triangle, these shows, this basically these triangles shows uh, they show um, 
voltages, the synaptic voltages, and the moment that the summation, this gray line hits the threshold, we have an output, a spike at time tau. And we basically, in a spike in neural networks, we're trying to find those relationships. A spike in neural networks are kind of newer compared to artificial neural networks, but both neural networks, I mean, artificial and spiking, they have extremely been successful and they have been used widely. So examples of applications of neural networks are like, for example, self-driving cars, right? And medicine, I was reading an article, they were trying to use artificial neural networks, artificial intelligence to come up with um, medicine for COVID, for example. Another example is they use artificial neural networks, for example, like artificial intelligence in MRI, like those images that they take from the brain, patient's brain. I have a friend of mine here, his PhD in electrical and computer engineering was using um, like artificial intelligence to optimize those images. Of course, this can help a lot. This can help the patients and also the doctors a lot for recognizing disorders or for example, cancers or tumors. Artificial intelligence or even used in power systems. Again, another friend of mine in like, for example, power system in electrical and computer engineering department, his project was to use artificial intelligence and detect if there is a power plant damage in a catastrophe, for example, a hurricane. So all these projects, you know, like this project of um, power system can guarantee that you have a mm, more resilient power going to your houses. So Simply put, artificial intelligence is everywhere. It, it is, it's being used almost everywhere in civil engineering, architecture, medicine, you name it. Well, thank you very much for listening to this presentation. These are a couple of references. And do you have any questions? <laughs>